Um, could you clarify what uh, the fourth quarter was in China in terms of sales and, and what precipitated the decline that you talked about briefly on stage? Um, well, we, we're going to wait for specific numbers until we do the quarterly earnings call. Um, and in any case, we don't, we don't usually break it out by region because people draw too much from these uh, quarter-to-quarter -quarter fluctuations. Um, so, um, I mean, I'd say that China was certainly a lot weaker than expected, um, mostly, I think, because of misperception about the difficulty of charging, um, which we're correcting. Um, and uh, we are seeing now an uptick in our sales in China, they just weren't all that significant in the fourth quarter. Um, but it was more than made up for by the demand in Europe and North America. And I, I think the China situation is temporary and will get corrected later this year. Charging. That, that it was hard to charge. How is that going to affect your balance proposition to customers and sales? Well, I, I think the, uh, f f it's not so much a question for the Model S or the Model X, which is a fairly expensive car. Um, I think very, not many people are choosing to buy or not buy the Model, Model S uh, because of gasoline prices. Um, it will have more of an effect on uh, lower cost cars, um, but um, the challenge there is just to make sure that the car. Uh, that the cost of, of, of a mass market electric car is low enough such that the gasoline price drop is not, um, you know, still makes it an economically sensible decision for somebody to buy. Um, but um, yeah, there's no question that the uh, gasoline prices will have some negative effect on mass market cars. I don't see it having an effect on Model S or X. Charlie Vogel, High Motor Trend Audio. Uh, You've had some success in certain markets, particularly California, Bay Area. Now with the announcement here of the bulk coming out, electric cars was what you were talking about. Infrastructure is a problem. Where does the cooperation and the growth happen there? I know you're doing things, but what about the rest? Uh, well, we, yeah, that, we're happy to, to cooperate on uh, charging systems on, you know, for the supercharged network. Um, and there have been some preliminary discussions with, with other companies. Um, and we've been very open that all, all that's needed is that somebody needs they need to make a car that is able to take the high power levels of the supercharger and then share proportionately in the cost of the system according to what their their usage of the network is um, and um, you know th that's why we're not really seeing the creation of very compelling uh, long long range charging systems apart from our own they're all like low power which which is not good for long distance charging so uh, but I, I mean, our supercharger network will cover the, you know, the, um, uh, the entire uh, lower 48 states and uh, all of Europe, most of China, most most of the world. You know, in the next couple of years, they'll be supercharged. With, uh, we'll be within range of a supercharger, so we don't really need some other network. Uh, let's see. How many automakers have taken you up on your offer of using your patents? Uh, we, we actually um, we don't require uh, any formal discussions, so they can just go ahead and use them. Um, Is there a license in no, you can just use them, okay. which I think is better because then the, you know you don't have to get into like any kind of discussions or whatever. So, so we, we don't know. I think you'll see you'll see it in the, the cars that come out, you know, if they choose to use them. Um, okay. Dave Shepardson, Detroit News. Do you see the new Chevy Bolt as a competitive threat to the Model 3, and what's your overall assessment of the plug-ins and the EVs unveiled here? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see it as a competitive threat just because I think all cars will go electric. So if you think of it, if, if you define the set of competitive cars of, of cars that are electric, then, then sure, it's, it's competitive. You, I, I, that's not what we see. We, the, it's really it's the competitive set of all cars, not simply cars that are electric. Um, so, uh, and there are 100 billion new cars and trucks made every year. So what does it matter if someone makes a few hundred thousand additional electric cars? It's, it's not going to affect us, really. Um, sure. I, I'll try to spend more time, I think, because otherwise I'm no, very few people are going to get their questions answered. Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, in, in the case of the, 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 the X, um, it took longer than expected to 
uh, solve some of the, the technical challenges of the car. Um, and we had, to, we, we had to focus our energy on, on other things. So um, doing uh, upgrades to the Model S, increasing the, the Model S production capability, um, uh, deploying to various other countries, uh, these, these all ended up being significant distractions. Um, and then the mod, and then the X, we, we did a bit of a two steps forward, one step back with the, with the X, because tr trying to get a car that's that has some radical new technology in it uh, right is, is is hard. I mean, if we just had a car with normal doors, it would be fine. But it's extremely important that the Falcon Wing doors are not just a gimmick, but that there are fundamental improvement in the utility of the car, uh, and that they work well and reliably. Hi, uh, Joanne Muller with Forbes. Um, have you met with any of the other uh, CEOs of any of the major automakers to talk about this uh, idea of more electric cars? Well, that's that's why I'm here. Who have you talked to while you're here? Uh, well, I talked to the whole audience. I haven't actually had. <laughs> I haven't. I mean, you had one-on-one -on -one no. conversations. No, not, not here. I've had one-on-one -on -one conversations um, in, in other in other cities. Um, I'm not going to talk about those conversations because then there's going to be articles written that I'm having some big alliance, <laughs> uh, and there'll be articles written like Elon wasn't. You know, he had to build it up and then knock it down, and it had nothing to do with it. So I'm, I'm just going to say less, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, sure. Who is Ben again? Benzinga.com. Uh, you've pushed hard for electric cars. You want the industry to recognize electric cars. If they actually do and they start to really produce them at a higher and better level, how much faster is that going to allow you to achieve your goals? Well, I, I mean, my goal is the is acceleration of the advent of, of electric cars, um, and so I'd be quite pleased to see other manufacturers make lots of electric cars. Um, and then as to whether Tesla, uh, you know, how Tesla does in that, it, it's a function of how good are the cars that we make. Are our cars better or worse, about the same as, as other manufacturers? Um, that will determine how many vehicles we sell. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, Lee Thomas talks to right here in Detroit. Uh, you're standing in a city that reinvented itself in down times. When you're in down times, how do you, what is your philosophy or what kind of uh, things do you think of to stay positive and going forward? I mean, even people, like you said on stage, some people that you respect say it was not going to work. What kind of things do you, or methods do you use to keep your mind in the right place and your company in the right place going forward? Well, I, I think, it, I just feel it's the, the, the um, Making electric cars and bringing them to, to ultimately to the mass market is an extremely important thing. Um, so even if people are negative or say we're going to fail, I don't care. We're still going to do it. Um, you know, the, the the beginning of Tesla and, and even for the first several years, uh, people kept saying how we we're going to fail, um, as though somehow uh, this was new information. You know, I knew that the probability of failure was extremely high. Uh, show in the back there. Uh, sure. So, and with Gigafactory, uh, we're sizing it to produce a, a huge amount of batteries. So, um, I think we could certainly uh, provide battery packs to uh, other car companies, as we've done before, and, and at a limited scale. Um, it, it is it, it is important to know, kind of in advance, w with some advance notice, uh, if it's a large order of battery packs, you can't just turn on a dime. Um, you know, it takes a couple of years to facilitize for that. Um, but we're more than happy to supply other manufacturers uh, once we get the factory up and running. Um, and sorry, what was the thing? What, oh, what should they do? They just, I mean, I think it's just important for the leaders of the big car companies to initiate serious electric vehicle programs. N not, not, not small ones that are like the minimum necessary to comply with regulations, but ones that, that where it's a really serious quarter million units a year type of uh, uh, product. And, and you kind of need to go at that sort of volume in order to get the economies of scale to make the car affordable. So, so it is a bet, but it's, it's, it's the right bet, I think. Uh, 
Um, I, was, I was pleased to see Mary Barra, you know, sounds like they're going to do something significant there with the bolt, and great, it's great. That's okay. Hey, um, so you're very vocal about the need for, I'm oh, sorry, Gabe, you want to talk about the need uh, so you've been very vocal about the need for other uh, companies to produce EVs to reduce emissions to deal with climate change. Um, if that's the case, then why so critical of hydrogen fuel cells, which are another pathway to zero emission vehicles? I mean, do you regret having been so critical? Do you stand by those comments? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean um, I don't want to turn this into a debate on hydrogen fuel cells because I, I just think that they're extremely silly. Um, um, so the and the people have published. There's multiple sort of uh, rebuttals of it of it online. Um, I mean, the it, it's just very difficult to to make hydrogen and store it and use it in a car. Um, it, it, hydrogen is an energy storage mechanism. It's not a source of energy. Um, so you have to get that hydrogen from somewhere. If you get that hydrogen from from water, so you're splitting uh, H2O, uh, the electrolysis is extremely inefficient as an energy process. Um, so. The, you know, if, if you compare, if, if you say took a uh, solar panel and used that energy from that solar panel to just charge a battery pack directly, uh, compared to uh, try to split water, take take the take the hydrogen, dump the oxygen, com compress the hydrogen to an extremely high pressure or liquefy it, um, and then put it in a car and run run a fuel cell, uh, that it, it is it is about half the efficiency. It's terrible. Like, so why, why would you do that? It makes no sense. And then uh, hydrogen is, has very low density. Um, it's a pernicious molecule that like, likes to get all over the place. Um, you, you get metal embrittlement from, from, from hydrogen. If you get a hydrogen leak, it's an invisible gas. You can't even tell that it's leaking. Um, uh, and, but then it's extremely flammable when, when it does and has an invisible flame. Um, if you're going to pick an energy storage mechanism, hydrogen is an incredibly dumb one to pick. You should just pick uh, methane. That's much, much easier, or propane. Um, and, and like, you know, hydrogen fuel cell, the, the best case hydrogen fuel cell doesn't win against the current case uh, batteries. So then obviously, it's, it's, it doesn't make sense. That, that will become apparent in the next few years. There's no, need, no reason for us to have this debate. I've said, uh, you know, my, my piece on this, it will be super obvious as time goes by. Um, I don't know what we're saying. So. Cliff Banks of the Banks Report. As Tesla begins to sell significantly more vehicles at a much lower price, it's going to change the retail experience that you guys provide now, especially in areas such as handling the trade and you need to take the trades from other brands, handling the financing. How are you guys preparing for that new world? Yeah, I mean, for us, trade-ins are relatively, or these trade-ins and Model S's are relatively low because they've only been in production for a little over two years. Um, but that it will become more of, more of a thing over time, so we're going to have to develop that infrastructure and figure it out. Um, yeah, it's, it's something I think we'll probably have to sort out uh, this year. It's going to be low for a long time, yeah. For a long time. Yeah. So in your own uh, soft-spoken way, I think mean, you're afraid of what it's going to do to the electric car industry. I mean, there's no, there's no uh, financial reason to do the change. I know, no, no, there is a financial right. reason still. I mean, it just, it, it, what, what it does, it, it's, I wouldn't look at, look at this as, as though it's a quantum change. Um, it's, it's a continuum. So... Uh, it's still way cheaper to, ha to, to run a, an electric car than a gasoline car, even at 40 or $50 a barrel for oil. It's still way cheaper. It's just that the, the, the delta is not as big if you're comparing it to $80 to $100 uh, oil. Um, so what, it, what, what the, the net effect is, is it reduces the economic forcing function that would normally be there as a result of the scarcity of, of, of oil. And, and, and so the, the, the rate of adoption of electric cars will be slower. Um, that's, that's what it means. It's not now electric people won't buy electric cars. It's just, it just the, it will, it, it's, it's less, there's less power in the economic forcing function. Would it make, would it make sense for you to be uh, making calls for a higher, higher fuel price, fuel 
I do think it's important. I, th I think it's extremely important that we establish a carbon tax. Um, this is a carbon tax that would apply to all carbon producing um, entities, so power plants, uh, to you know, anything that, so to both to electricity generation from hydrocarbons as well as as production of gasoline uh, or, or consumption of gasoline. Um, and I think that that, uh, that that will actually that will also increase the, for the price of electricity uh, to the degree that the electricity is uh, coming from hydrocarbons, um, and it will increase the price of gasoline. Um, but I think this is important because we're, right now we're consuming this extremely valuable common good, which is the carbon capacity of the oceans and atmosphere, and and we're not paying anything for that consumption. Um, this is like having the garbage pile in your street and nobody's paying for it, and the garbage gets higher and higher. Eventually. Terrible things happen. So uh, it's just very important to put uh, a price on, you know, if, if somebody's dumping chemicals in the atmosphere, they need to pay for it. You mentioned that your sales are going very well in Europe. Can you tell us which markets are driving that and whether you see another year of growth in 2015 in Europe? Yeah. Um, actually, we're seeing uh, broad growth in all of our markets in Europe. Um, so in the second half of the year, particularly, we saw uh, quite significant growth um, in northern and, and western Europe. So uh, we, we, our sales in sort of Italy and Spain are, are very tiny. Um, uh, but but at, for, uh, as, you, as you get sort of north, um, Benelux, Switzerland, uh, Scandinavian countries, uh, UK, um, we're starting to see some um, progress also in France and Germany, um, so and Austria, of course. So. Uh, so we're, it's, it's it's looking you know quite quite good actually on the European front. Do you expect to uh, increase your sales in 2015 in Europe? Probably. Sure. Yeah, Eric Kessler with the, the New York Times, second day. Uh, a quick question on China. If we go back real quick, could you unpack a little bit what the charging issue was? Was it an issue with the Chinese consumers understanding all electric cars and how they charge, or just the Tesla specifically? Yeah, actually, real quick, could I show you for like a word or something? Oh, yeah, the, the, the big misperception um, that, that we're dealing with, and I think it's getting corrected, is that people weren't able to, it, would have difficulty establishing um, a charge uh, point in their, in their uh, condo. It's like, so in their apartment building, um, would they be able to, to have um, a high power wall connector? Would they be able to charge at home? And for, uh, there, there was a misperception that it was somehow very difficult to establish uh, a, a charging in apartment buildings in China. It's actually not. So mainly apartment dwellers? Is well, in, in the cities, yes. Um, so that, that, um, so we're, we're fixing that misperception. We also have now completed a large number of supercharges for long distance travel within China. I think that, that's pretty important. Um, we also just uh, uh, announced the exec rear seat. So we have a much more comfortable rear seat because a lot of customers in China will uh, be driven in the rear seat as opposed to drive the car themselves, or they'll switch. They'll sometimes drive themselves, sometimes be driven. Um, and, and so it, for them, they, they really wanted a more comfortable back seat. And we just uh, announced that. Um, so who hasn't had a chance to? Sure. Yeah, I think people's, people should be concerned about safety with autonomous vehicles. Um, you know, we don't want two-ton death bots running, roaming the street. Um, and, and I think the, the standard for safety for autonomous vehicles should be much higher than it is for people. You know, I think probably to go to full autonomy, I think we'd want to show statistically that it's more like a factor of 10 safer than a person. And I think most people would say, okay, if it's 10 times safer than a person, then it's good. Um, and uh, and then we need to prove that. So I, so I, I think we'll really have sort of mainstream cars capable of, of full autonomy in five years or less. Uh, but uh, proving that it's safe and getting the regulatory approval is likely to take uh, two to three years after that. Um, so but it's probably seven or eight years uh, there'll be fully autonomous cars that you can just buy. I, you know, we'll 
so I think I think we'll be first to market with autonomous with, with the most advanced autonomous features. Yeah, I, th I think I think Model Three is going to be a, a great car, um, and um, what do you give up in a gap between thirty-five thousand? Well, it, it will be a smaller car. Yeah, so for one thing, it'll be smaller, um, probably twenty percent smaller than the Model S, which is a, Model S is a fairly big car, um, and uh, it, obviously it'll be made at a you know, sort of five to ten times higher volume, so that's economy of scale to be had there. Um, some of the, the elements that are sort of maybe uh, come, come for free with the Model S might be options on the Model 3. Um, but for the Model 3, like the biggest thing that I'm kind of struggling with is I really want the Model S to be something different, not, not, look, not, not just be a smaller Model S. You know, so how do we make a car that's really way different from any other car on the road uh, in a way that's actually that's really useful, and just doesn't feel like a weird mobile. Yeah. You, you talked about uh, uh, profitability in 2020 when when the Model Three is in full production. Is that the time frame that you think investors are are anticipating? Oh, I'm sorry, John Lipton, Bloomberg. I'm sorry. Do you think that's what I mean, I, I honestly don't know what in investors are, are anticipating. And I've certainly said that uh, Tesla's expectation is that we will reinvest our cash flow into developing new technologies, new, new products, and increasing our production volume for many years to come. So in, in that context, obviously, one should not expect near-term profitability. Um, now, that said, I mean, on, I think we, we will have, like, non-gap profitability uh, before then. Um, I'm just not sure that we'll have gap profitability before 2020. Um, but I think, you know, any, any given sort of revenue stream of the company, like Model S or X or the three, um, if you were to just separate that from the business and look at the gross margin and say, what, what sort of free cash flow is that product line delivering? And, uh, uh, you, it, and you looked at each one, it would look very compelling. And the only reason it doesn't look maybe financially compelling uh, is that when you combine these things and you're also at the early stage of new products and you're spending a lot on new products, the combined thing may not look good, but it, it looks good if you parse it out by, by vehicle. Sure. Sure, not asked. Um, Mark feels that Ford has said they stripped down on one of the last two and familiar with the design. Are there any elements to the bolt or any of the new? No. <laughs> Can't think of anything. We have time for about two more questions. All right, so who hasn't had a chance, I guess, with that? Tom Krischer. Um, if you be successful in coming out with a $30,000 bolt, you can go 200 miles in the charts. Do you have to reassess the price point of the model three? Well, I think they're saying uh, thirty thousand after the seventy-five hundred dollars tax credit, so they're really saying thirty-seven five hundred. Uh, when I say th thirty-five thousand, I'm talking about without any credits. So technically, we actually set a lower number than than, than them. Yeah, sure. I'm not sure I'll even be alive in 2025. <laughs> will civilization will still be here? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you going to move on to something else? I mean, you're a bright guy. You've got a lot of interest. Do you want to move on, or do you want to see this through that long? Um, I, I'm committed to stay at Tesla as long as I'm alive. So if I'm not dead, <laughs> then I'll, I'll, I'll be at Tesla. I might not be the CEO of Tesla. I was going to say the same thing. Okay. Um, but I, I think um, I, I will certainly be with the company forever. Um, and, um, and, and, and what I have 
said is that I'm committed to be the CEO through volume production of the mass market car because that's that's what I set out to do. So once I've you know, many years ago set out to do that, accomplish that, then I'll reevaluate whether it makes sense to, for me to be the CEO or whether perhaps somebody else should be the CEO, and um, and uh, you know I you know just spend time on kind of product, product development and engineering, which is what I like to do. Um, I'm not sure most people, if you'll actually realize that most of my day is actually engineering and design. It's not, any, you know, it's what I spend 80% of my time on. So, sure. I'll, I'll do one more. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Uh, Mark Rex from the Consumer Reports. Um, you've made a lot of I love mistakes. Consumer Reports. You've made a lot of statements about how proud you are that you're able to make this kind of vehicle in the United States. But in talking about your volume aspirations, you get to half a million, then you start talking about several million a year. Obviously, that means more factories. How much production do you see actually happening in the U.S. once you outgrow Fremont, yeah. as opposed to offshoring to low-cost markets like China, Eastern Europe, et cetera? Well, it's more that you know, if, if Fremont's sort of capacity is about half a million units a year, um, and it, it, it kind of makes sense if you're making a mass market car, particularly to do local production, because other than if, if you Otherwise, you, if you make, like if we made a low-cost car in California and then ship that to, to China, it would be kind of crazy. Um, so it would make more sense to establish a factory in China for local production and establish a factory in Europe for local production there so we don't have to put cars on ships. Because um, then that, you know, we're, it's one thing if you're like making iPhones or something and you can put 10,000 of them in a, uh, you know, a sea van. Um, but you, if you put like two cars or 10,000 iPhones, there's like very big difference in logistics costs. Uh, so it makes sense, I think, to uh, have local production for that market um, uh, as time goes by. So I, th I think you could expect to see us set up in the long term a factory in Europe and a factory in Asia, and probably another factory in the U.S. You know, closer to the East Coast at some point. Like Detroit? It's not out of the question. Um, you know, maybe Michigan shouldn't stop us from selling cars here. That would be <laughs> a nice gesture. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Very much. Thank you.